Joshi, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure and also uh, listening to Tarana and to Arturo. Um, I'm feeling very sensitive, yeah. kind of upregulated. Yeah. Maybe you are as well. And uh, it's exactly in situations like this, I think it's useful to just take a moment, not to turn away, but actually to presence. Whatever your experience is in this moment, mm -hmm. whether it's detachment or horror or gratitude yeah. for being in a place where this kind of truth and experience can be shared in an unfiltered way with us. Mm. It's really important for us to listen deeply to what was shared in relation to violence, virtual violence, gender violence, sexual violence. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe bringing your attention to the sensation of your feet on the floor. Kind of what I was addressing yesterday, how do we stay grounded in, in the midst hmm. of taking in information which is so raw and real? and breath deep in the body. And remembering really why you're here. Mm -hmm. And noticing whatever you're experiencing in this moment. And breath again deep in the body. Mm. I'm going to ask us as we touch into what our experience is, just to find one word that characterizes it, you know, without judgment, kind of unprescribed, just sense into, you know, going to essence. And maybe quietly say that word to a person next to you. Thank you. I'm moved. Mm. Yeah. I, I would have to say I'm, I'm humbled. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Maybe begin? Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for your presence. And thank you so much, Roshi, for grounding us after that. We were, we were experiencing the talks backstage. And crossing the street to come to the venue, you know, an hour or so ago, we thought we could so be in our head in this, but let's move into our hearts and let's have fun. And those were some weighty topics to enter our time together with, so I appreciate you honoring them. And the way that you started that is actually um, taking me to one of the first things I wanted to talk about today, which is how you ended up in this very dynamic and multifaceted work that you do in the world, which is so much about the inner journey and compassion and empathy and purposefulness. And in getting to know you and looking at your life, I see that 
you actually had your first experience that possibly evoked this as a very young child. I, I read that you, you had polio, and you told me earlier today that you experienced complete blindness from the ages of from four to six years old. Can you tell us about how that defined you hmm. as a human being? You know, I want to speak to uh, the two women who really uh, opened uh, this door of life for me. Mm -hmm. uh, one was my mother, who was uh, a, a pathological altruist. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> she was a good one. Well, she was. She, uh, you know, uh, that's a longer conversation, uh, but. <laughs> But you know, our mothers, in a certain way, uh, give us a signature in life. And also, if we're lucky, we learn so much from our mothers. What to do and not to do. Well, I, I learned um, a, a little late in the game mm -hmm. uh, about good self-stewardship. Mm. But I also learned about how important it is to serve others. I mean, you know, when um, I was young, she was a gray lady. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, at, uh, for, you know, people returning from war, and she was, you know, with wounded military people. Mm. And the day she died, she was a pink lady. <laughs> so, okay. And uh, she was delivering books to um, dying people, and then that night she bled out and died. Mm. And it was a thread in a certain way. Her whole life really was about service. But... Um, she didn't access what so many of us have access, the kind of work that we have done as practitioners, as people who have you know, a deep practice, of, as people who have done a lot of psychological work. Mm -hmm. I remember years later, I got my family into family therapy and we went in and I said, we had one session, we walked out and my father looked at my mother and like, I don't think we really need to do this. And that was it. That she was the end. Very <laughs> short, you know. But in any case, it was an era. And I, you know, I feel uh, both educated by the era in which my mother, you know, was a woman. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't want to ever, you know, have that era embrace, you know, a generation of women in the future. Yeah. The other woman was someone my family hired. Um, to look after me when I was very, very sick. And uh, it was a woman called Lilla Robinson. She was a black woman. Yep. Her mother had been a slave. And where my mother had a kind of uh, taste of grief in her life, this woman, Lilla, who took care of me actually for years, mm. um, this woman had a taste of joy in her life. Mm. And she was just fantastic. She was so much fun. So instead of me in a maximum pity party around being so horribly sick, she just gave me this vitamin of play. Wow. And um, she didn't a offer one ounce of pity to me. <laughs> um, what she offered to me day after day was joy. Mm. And I mean, I, you've got to understand, this woman... I lived in a restricted neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Jewish people could not live in that neighborhood. We didn't particularly like Catholics. And um, uh, Lilla was not allowed to use our toilets in the main house. Mm. Um, she had a very uh, tiny toilet in the garage. Wow. Well, uh, needless to say, being the object of uh, that kind of relationship um, was transformative. Mm -hmm. You know, both my mother, I mean, I, I was brought up in a racist household. Yeah. But, you know, when you're in the waters of racism or sexism, for example, you don't know you're in the waters uh, of those uh, toxins, you know, until at a certain point you wake up. And part of that happened because I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. And it was like I realized I had an inner life Mm. when I was a child. Mm. And I mean, all children, I think, have inner lives. But when you're actually recursively, you realize 
you have an inner life because you are reinventing the world yeah. in your imagination. You have long periods, you know, of sensory deprivation and actually no contact with anybody, mm. so of solitude. And this is shaping your psyche in a very sure. fundamental way. Sure. So the vitamin of joy, yeah. <laughs> if you will, instead of you know, sort of being soaked in um, self-pity, mm -hmm. I felt really soaked in possibility. Wow. wow. And um, later on, uh, independent of that situation, my mother said to my sister and me, do anything you want. And I was like, oh, I mm. just got the ticket to life. <laughs> and that is really, um, uh, I, I'm not sure I would say it to my children today, by the way, <laughs> after hearing Arturo, yeah. where I think I need to get into therapy again or something. But uh, it's like, oh, my God. Well, yeah, because I mean, she, she didn't have the opportunities you have had she in this didn't. life. She didn't. Is that part of why you've been so active and ambitious? I mean, you're, you have... You have really had seven or eight careers that I'm aware of, <laughs> many of them very impactful. Is it that you're living out a bit what your mom couldn't because of that era? You know, I think I have very high risk tolerance yeah. for some reason. You know, I just, I, I was married to Stanislav Grof, some of you might know. Um, he and I collaborated on uh, the LSD project working with dying cancer patients. This was Years in, ago. Years ago, 1972. Yeah. I mean, 50 years ago, 52 years ago. <laughs> and what was that project? What did you do when you say working with Well, you know, we were co-therapists with people dying of cancer. It was just really an incredible experience. But also, um, I was taking a lot of LSD along that marriage thread. <laughs> and um, I had the hubris, Cecily, I'm embarrassed to say, said, I want to know everything about the human unconscious. And it was like... I paid for that hubris wow. as I got so dysregulated from, you know, the psychedelic adventures wow. that uh, I found myself on. But there's been a kind of, you know, uh, deep curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, I drove across the Sahara Desert in 1969, you know, in a Volkswagen bus where I went to Germany and worked with the engineers to redesign the bus. And there I had this experience of being in a vast landscape that was more nuanced than any place uh, I have ever been because mm. of, uh, it was like an open text. Perspective. It was just incredible. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, I think, I, you know, so I'm 81. I look back and I thought, oh, my Buddha. I mean, it's just a miracle <laughs> that I survived that adventure. I was, good at, I was an anthropologist. I was going to Mali to see a rite of passage that happens once every 60, 53 to 60 years mm. where an entire culture is renewed. Yeah. And it really turned, you know, then I had a rite of passage uh, just getting there. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, with, you know, many stories, but not for today. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was while I was with the Dogon um, that I had this powerful realization that in Western culture, we had basically obliterated the rites of passage that allow for people to go through the experience of maturation. Yeah. And we were actually in this situation where there were, quotes, rites of passage, like the military or the kind of dangerous things that I did as a young person. Yeah. In this effort to redefine my own situation, push myself into and like being in the military, in a, a highly uh, threatening situation where this kind of fundamental transformation could happen, but not with the sacred context of mm. culture. Mm. And I saw it in the Dogon culture. Yeah. I was just, and I, I went, this is before uh, Stan and I married. When I came back and uh, Stan and I got married, I realized the LSD work was a contemporary rite of passage, mm. kind of at the last minute for people who were in the final stages of life. Right. And this, this theme of going to edges and risk taking is across your life. And something that we've talked a little bit is there's maybe not enough of that today. Do you see this? What do you recognize in our current youth? And, you know, 
Arturo's talk aside, let's, yeah. I, I mean in non-online terror contexts, how can we kind of continue to have some of that appetite for risk where we learn at those edges? What are you seeing? You know, Stephanie, Cecily, sorry. Cecily, I think that for me the issue really rests with the desacralization in Western culture. Mm. Um, for example, I have, I've had a lot of therapy, thank Buddha, uh, you know, Uncle Stan, thank you, that was quite a, a thing. Um, but of course, uh, you know, Jungian therapy, I was in psychoanalysis when I was 21. There's not much to say in psychoanalysis when you're 21, but yeah. I had three years of psychoanalysis, went through the Esalen dance and so on. But uh, so it's, a, it's kind of sacred work, but it's more transactional in an yeah. interesting way. Like you're trying to get over something. Yeah. And, um, and to be another person instead of in a certain way being who you really are. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And when, you know, as a young anthropologist, seeing these contexts, you know, which were fundamentally sacred, where people's lives, you know, it's whether, you know, at birth, at puberty, at marriage, at, you know, the first birth of a child, um, becoming an elder and so on, or even the rite of passage of moving from place to place, yeah. or the rites of passage associated with the transitions in our seasons, yeah. where, you know, people, you know, go into very deep states of consciousness in order to, you know, meet the spring, yeah. meet yeah. new life. Yeah. Without that in our culture, um, we seek uh, at the pre-conscious level these transformational experiences mm -hmm. um, that uh, are, have no context within our own culture for sense making. Yeah. And that is really pretty interesting to watch. You know, I, I'm not an anthropologist anymore. That was several lifetimes ago, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, I would like to see, for example, the, you, you can imagine, um, being one of the quotes pioneers in the psychedelic work, yeah. along with my, because I married Stan. <clears throat> Seeing this phenomenal resurgence of psychedelia, if you will, um, and Stan, thank Buddha, is still alive, so he can enjoy that outcome. <laughs> you know, but most of the, our peers are gone. You know, Weston Labar, Richard Evan Schultes, and the, you know, mm. Ralph Metzner, and so on, they're gone. But I'm happy Stan is still here and he can, you know, have the sense of uh, kind of, I'm sure, some kind of wild joy yeah. in seeing it. But there's so many issues, you know, as this particular process unfolds around medicalization, commodification, sure. the effects on indigenous cultures and so on. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I feel is really uh, important, you know, at this point is how do we, and I'm so grateful to Ron, uh, Cecily brought the word dignity mm -hmm. um, into our community yeah. here. Yeah. It's just really uh, such a powerful word because it has to do with fundamental respect. Yeah. And the sense um, also of, uh, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh uses this word, term, uh, uh, Kazuaki Tanahashi, the amazing calligrapher and the Dogen translator, the miracles of this moment, mm. the, the miraculousness that we have been given life. And one of the things that I often say in relation to the criticality, we're, you know, we're in a multi-crisis, a polycrisis now, many uh, expressions of it. And, you know, I say, I was born for mm. this time. Mm -hmm. I was born for this time. You know, instead of feeling the oppression, it's more the energy to meet the suffering and sorrows of this world mm. with, you know, a sense of uh, radical openness and um, a willingness to be engaged. Yeah. And I think that's given me some kind of life. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we were talking about last night, which I was particularly touched by as a parent, and having been part of these conversations yesterday and the evening before, is what you refer to as the trivialization of trauma. Yeah. 
And it's a sensitive topic. But we do have a generation, I might have a, a couple Gen Zers in my house, <laughs> um, that seem to kind of reflex into victimhood really quickly. It's COVID that did this to us, and I don't mean to be dismissive of the harms of COVID, but there's a lot of this happened to me happening. Or you all have left us with this environmental crisis. This is all happening to us. And, and this ties into what you're referring to. How do we meet the difficulties and challenges without drowning in this kind of self, over self-analysis or self-pity, or in what I'm seeing in some Gen Zers, this victimhood orientation that seems to be very trendy? So I have a, you know, I deeply honor people who have been through um, profoundly threatening situations. Yeah. And I mean, Tehran is a perfect example. Um, in a way, like someone like Malala or Nelson Mandela, individuals who, you know, have uh, been attacked and, you know, almost killed or imprisoned for decades. And, but it, the issue around trauma is really important. And the identification of one as a victim, oneself as a victim, mm. where we accumulate some kind of social merit out of weakness. Yeah. And um, it is, you know, we, in a certain way, we need role models like Mandela, Malala, and, and Tarana is a perfect example. You know, of those individuals who have actually worked um, skillfully in one way or another, and there are sort of many paths to, to working the edge of shock, of violence that one is subjected to, mm -hmm. where actually one becomes stronger as a yeah. result of that. Yeah. And I would say I'm a stronger person for having been so sick as a child. Of course. You know, I, I, and I, so I thank that experience. Mm. You know, and I was given, if you will, the leg up by my caregiver <laughs> yeah. who um, didn't victimize me mm -hmm. or, t you know, or drop me into a victim narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that the issues of, you know, working with trauma, and I, I, but one of the most interesting things for me has to do with the ayahuasca sessions being done for um, those who are out of, you know, veterans out of the military who are incredibly traumatized, mm. where those sessions are done in the context of a sort of sacred view. Yeah. And um, it's not recreational, yeah. it's recreational in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other issue that, uh, you know, as I said, there's some kind of social merit in, you know, being, blaming others for yeah. the situation, which of course means you are uh, not taking any responsibility yourself for your own development. Mm -hmm. But the other thing um, has to do, from my point of view, um, is uh, working with the truth of suffering. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I often say, so. Uh, uh, Cecily has in her hand this book called Standing at the Edge. It was uh, a book that came out a couple of years ago. And um, uh, I have uh, in the book, um, uh, in a way, the book is all my problems, but not really. They're all the problems <laughs> that were brought to me, <laughs> like pathological altruism, empathic distress, uh, disrespect. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, moral suffering um, and burnout and so on, which I learned from, you know, the hundreds of people that I've interacted with in, you know, in the end of life care field, but also the human rights field, environmentalists and so on. Mm -hmm. And to realize there's this landscape of virtue that has potholes in it. Mm -hmm. And um, the mm -hmm. key to actually pulling oneself out of those potholes is compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the key to working, you know, with one's own sorrows, wounds, uh, um, I believe is compassion. Yeah. You know, it's having the capacity to actually attend to one's experience or the experience of another. You know, having the experience of concern, mm -hmm. like not disavowing the fact that you're in a difficult situation, that you're grieving. Yeah. 
um, that you're taken aback by what Arturo shared, or Tawana shared, um, that you're taken aback when you walk down the streets of San Francisco yeah. by the unsheltered yeah. um, and so forth. You're taken aback by what's happening in the Middle East or Ukraine or with our climate catastrophe. Yeah. It's really important to contact the truth of you know, suffering as it meets you or arises in you. But it's also to understand we have these phenomenal capacities within us to transform our response to the truth of suffering. Yeah. I mean, it's a basically the Four Noble Truths, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's a Buddhist paradigm. It's pretty sharp, actually. And how, how do you differentiate between compassion and empathy? Ah, wonderful question. Actually, compassion and empathy are often conflated. Yeah. And, um, you know, I say empathy, uh, a world without empathy is a world where we are dead to each other. Mm. Empathy is really important. It's our capacity to be in physical resonance, emotional resonance, and, and also cognitive resonance. It's where our, you know, our subjectivity expands to include the experience of another. It's yeah. very important. Yeah. Compassion is not an emotion. Amen. I mean, I think we have to understand that. And I sort of outline, you know, compassion involves a, a suite of processes that when they interact with each other allows for compassion to emerge. Mm. And those properties include our capacity to actually give attention fully to another without judgment. Mm -hmm. Our deep capacity to feel genuine concern. Mm. You know, where we are, we, we really feel concern yeah. at, at a very visceral level. Yeah. And then our capacity to discern deeply, mm. to look deeply, what, what will serve. Yeah. There's no algorithm. Yeah. Every situation, every person really calls forth a different response. Yeah. It's all contingent. Yeah. It's all spontaneous. Mm. And um, so you discern what will really serve and then to actually engage. And, you know, you don't hear emotion actually in that except for this kind of the sense of concern. Yeah. But then this process of compassion, and I, I so appreciated uh, the Dalai Lama. He said, you know, compassion is not a luxury. It is a necessity for human beings to survive. Especially now. And especially not just humans. You know, yeah. you were hearing Asa a day before, whatever, okay. last month. <laughs> you know, I, we are not the center of the universe. It's yeah. for, for the, you know, the multiplicity of species yeah. to actually survive. I mean, we're seeing this sixth grade extinction. Yeah. You know, we're living in it and we are of it. Yeah. at this very moment. Mm. So compassion is this fundamental process without which not only we, but many beings cannot survive. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, yeah. thank you. You know, a little bird told me that you were the first uh, person that Sora never asked to come to a Wisdom 2.0. Oh, he's a tall bird. <laughs> He is a tall bird. Uh, he's a tall bird. Yeah, you're a tall, beautiful I'm bird. I'm a tall too. bird, too. <laughs> um, so you have been part of this community and this conversation for the entirety of it. And um, we know you literally landed from Japan and came straight here. And we just thank you for your vivaciousness and your passion and your generosity. Oh, it's such an honor. I just love uh, what Soren and the whole team has done o over the years. It's been so brave and... And it is so needed at this time, the conversations that we're entering into. And as I said, you know, like what Arturo shared and Tawana and others have shared, you know, this kind of unfiltered opening of uh, how the world is and how we're invited to meet it yeah. at this time. Thank you so much. So thank you, Cecily. Thank you, thank you Roshi. Thank you, everybody. Well.